Hello, uh, I'm Sybil Peril, and I am the pastor of the Lylesville Charge, Olivet, and Forestville United Methodist Churches. And today is Monday the 5th. Um, you may have heard if you were on the, the phone tree messages yesterday and today that I dumped my phone in the toilet yesterday. And since I had not had time to download the video off of my phone onto a computer, we are without that video. Um, my phone is still resting in rice right now and hoping, praying that it will rejuvenate itself. So uh, I am going to redo the video uh, sitting here in my kitchen in Woodleaf, North Carolina. Uh, if you look behind me, this is my dining room. Uh, the, the corner cupboard here was, was made uh, using pegs by my, uh, my great-grandfather. Uh, and the churches behind me, the, uh, the wooden church, is the original Woodleaf United or Methodist Episcopal Church South, which was um, built in 1891 and is my home church. I was not there then. Uh, so the one here, what they did was split this church right down the middle, took the roof and split it and um, put it together and made this church, uh, which is now, it's, this is the church that I grew up in uh, and still attend on occasion if I'm here on a Sunday. Uh, so that is that is little pieces of of, uh, of my house here in in Woodleaf, and um, you know since I'm going part time, I am here uh, part of the time, and then I am down in Lylesville part of the time. So you may see further videos uh, from here if I can't get there. Uh, so with all of that being said. Uh, I'm going to redo uh, the worship service from yesterday um, without the music. I'm not going to sing for you today, uh, but uh, let's open with a prayer because goodness knows we need it. Holy God, we long for the day that your truth will cover this nation and the entire world. Lead us today as we battle the forces of evil in this world, one person at a time. Open us to what the scriptures are saying to each of us this day. Amen. Before I begin the reading of the scripture for today, I'd like to talk with you for a moment about why I don't preach patriotic sermons and why there was so little of 4th of July celebration in our worship as a whole yesterday, other than the music and being mentioned in prayer. The birth of our nation is a, is a grand day, uh, a day for celebrations as it was all over the United States. Uh, and it is, it is a national holiday. But theologians will tell you that it is a secular holiday. This means that it has no correlation with religion or the church in general. So I don't usually do sermons that have to do with these types of holidays. We acknowledged them yesterday with the music. Uh, we, we did America the Beautiful and we did um, the Battle Hymn of the Republic yesterday. Uh, so if you know those songs, you can sing them whenever you like, uh, but we will not, I will not be singing them today. For me, though, the reason I don't use a patriotic theme or a national holiday theme usually is because, uh, to me, time for church is a time to be in worship, to be in praise with God. It's a time for us to tell God thank you for all the blessings that we have received, and, and which includes this country. And it's a time to read and understand scripture in a different way. It's a time to draw closer to our Lord and our Savior. So you will probably not ever hear me say, let's do the national anthem, 
uh, as part of a service. And that's just one of those weird things about me that maybe you didn't know. Um, but hopefully you are still off today on Monday afternoon and are enjoying your holiday weekend. Okay, with all of that said, let's look at the scripture for today. Our scripture is from the gospel according to Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible today. I hope that you have a Bible close hand, at hand. If you don't, then just let me have your attention really, truly for a few minutes as I read the gospel reading today. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James and Jose, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to them, Prophets are honored everywhere except in their own hometowns, among their relatives, and in their own households. He was unable to do any miracles there except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled by their disbelief. Then Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages teaching. He called for the twelve and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick, no bread, no bags, and no money in their belts. He told them to wear sandals, but not to put uh, an, on an extra shirt. He said, whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. If a place doesn't welcome you or listen to you as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a witness against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should change their hearts and lives. They cast out many demons and they anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some time ago, I watched a movie called Rise of the Titans. Now, I know it's odd for a grown-up to watch an animated movie, which this was, but sometimes they're really more for adults than kids because of the jokes that they use and the themes that they encompass. And this movie, for me, was one of those that could be enjoyed by adults pretty easily. The movie came out several years ago, and if you've not seen it, let me tell you a little about it. The idea is that the boogeyman wants to take over the children of the world and keep them in a state without hope. So he kills off the Sandman. That causes so many nightmares for the kids that they lose their faith in things like the Easter Bunny, Father Christmas, the Tooth Fairy, and even Jack Frost. As the children cease to believe, the legends of childhood lose their strength to fight the boogeyman off because the legends get their strength from the faith children have in them. It finally comes down to one child being the holdout who then reignites the belief in the local children and they, along with the revitalized legends, defeat the boogeyman together. But the part that struck me was the change in the Easter Bunny during all of this. In the beginning, when he was a full-fledged legend, he wasn't some soft, cuddly, fluffy bunny. Instead, he was a six-foot menace with a sword and boomerangs. He was from Australia, you see. But as his strength failed because of the children's unbelief, he became that tiny baby bunny, all fluff and ears. 
He still had a bad attitude, though. Now, you're thinking, what in the world does this have to do with the scripture today? Why am I talking about the Easter Bunny and a bunch of childhood legends? And I just said that I didn't do secular things. Well, it struck me that in our scripture today, Jesus is a lot like that Easter Bunny. He had been going about preaching and healing for a while and had quite a following he had performed great miracles, and people were in awe of his wisdom and his knowledge. But in his hometown, where no one believed in him, he couldn't do much in the way of healing or miracles. He needed their belief to increase his power against evil. The one thing, other thing that struck me about the movie was that it took a partnership, a team, to defeat the boogeyman. The heroes, Father Christmas and the Easter Bunny and all of those guys, couldn't do it by each of them taking on the villain one by one. They couldn't even defeat him when they worked together. They were just too weak without someone believing that they could do it. It took teamwork with the kids and the heroes to bring the boogeyman down. One of the things I hear a lot these days, especially post-pandemic, is that with all the technology we have, with online worship and blogs, with being able to text scripture and do Facebook groups and phone tree messages, Zoom meetings, why do we need to go to church? Well, I'll tell you why. It's about fellowship. It's about community. It all comes back to that idea of doing things alone or together. Because it takes teamwork to defeat the forces of evil around us today. It takes more than just you to draw you closer to God. You need the help of a church community to help you understand the scriptures and the books you read and the movies you watch. You need someone to hold you accountable for your own journey. You need someone to share in the responsibilities of mission. Notice that Jesus sent the disciples out in twos. There were a couple of reasons for this. It was much safer to travel with someone instead of being on those roads alone. But there was also a Levitical law that said that there had to be two witnesses to verify any actions taken. So he sent them out in twos to support each other, to help each other along the way, to encourage each other, and to be a witness for each other. But he didn't send them out with much of anything but each other and their belief in him. No extra cloak or sandals or even a chunk of bread. And this was very unusual in their culture. Even those that were on a pilgrim's journey took extra clothing and supplies. And people always took bread to eat along the way. It would keep for days. But Jesus wanted them to have to depend on others for any help they needed. He wanted them to learn the idea of teamwork with those they went to serve. We, too, need to understand these ideas of belief and teamwork. They truly do go hand in hand. It's not enough for us to just give out food and clothing. There needs to be that teamwork with those that we serve to raise them out of the poverty they are in and help them experience a miracle, maybe of a new job or a place of their own to live. And we have to believe in Christ or we have nothing. We have no power. We have to accept him on faith. I mean, we haven't seen him. We weren't alive when he was here on earth. But we have to believe that he was a real person and that not only that, but that he still lives in our hearts and with God at his right hand. And in believing, we're given strength to carry on Christ's message of love and grace. And maybe we'll even get to see or participate in a miracle.
even these days. Have you ever heard of prayer warriors? These are people with so much faith that when they pray, things happen. I've mentioned them before in phone tree messages of calling on the prayer warriors to pray for someone. Prayers get answered when they pray and miracles occur. We need to all be prayer warriors, but some of us are just stronger at it than others. It's, it's their spiritual gift. But we have to believe in the power of God to such an extent that when we pray, things will happen. But we also need to be part of a team that prays together. Because the more people pray together, the more power over evil we have. We are part of a team that's called the church. We need the fellowship, the community. And I think the pandemic really showed us that in some ways. We missed seeing each other and being together. We need each other's witness to help us on our journey toward God and a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. So by working together as a team with the community, we find that things happen. Notice that the disciples did many miracles, healing, casting out demons, but they believed. They believed that Jesus had given them the power and they knew that he had the power to give. We need to believe in Christ, believe that he still has the power to give us power to do miracles even today. Maybe it's the miracle of someone understanding God's love by what you do and that they begin to believe in him too. Maybe it's the miracle of someone finding that new job or maybe it's the courage that they get to go on to college. Maybe it's the miracle of us realizing as the church that we are a team and that together we can do so very much. Going back to my movie, the other thing I noticed was that it came down to one child, just one, just one child believing to re-energize the children and the heroes. It all starts with one. It is those one-on-one -on -one conversations where a movement begins and is nurtured, where a relationship grows. It's one person's idea of a way to bring others to Christ that gives others the energy to try. And a movement gets started. John Wesley started the Methodist movement. He was not intending a new denomination, but simply to re-energize the Anglican church because it had just gotten to be so very, very dull. And he thought that people who believed in God and saw things happening and felt that love in their hearts would have a little more energy than they did in the Anglican church. And so he began to have these, these meetings and things, and the, and the Methodist movement started. He started it all by preaching in the fields to workers who were going to work and coming home from work. In the United States, in the early days, they used this idea of outdoor preaching to spread Methodism through camp meetings. And a lot of Methodist churches, including my own church, were started under a tree or in an arbor with one person with a Bible and a word to share with people from God. Are you the one to start a mission or a committee or a class? Are you the one to volunteer as a reading buddy or a greeter at the school? Are you the one to tell someone of your faith journey and bring them closer to God through it? 
Are you the one to believe that miracles do still take place? If people truly believe in Jesus Christ and the power of prayer. I hope you'll search your hearts and find that you do. That you are the one. God bless. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we are thankful this day that we have a place to worship. That there are ways that we can communicate with people who can no longer be in church. We thank you for the blessings of this beautiful weekend. I thank you for the joining of two people, my niece and her fiance, yesterday on a boat in Lake Norman. What a wonderful thing it was and how beautiful the weather was for them. I thank you for a love that has been found. And I just ask your blessing on them as they continue their lives together. We are in awe of you, Lord, and your power. We are in awe of the Trinity. We don't understand it, but we are in awe of this idea of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and God the Father together. We thank you that Jane has done well with her first week of treatments and, and that Carla has been able to be home for a couple of weeks. We just ask that you continue to be with her as she begins to get ready to go back for that second round of treatments. We ask you to be with those who are grieving, especially those in, in Florida who have lost loved ones and they, they haven't even been able to find the bodies yet. We just ask you to be with them, Lord, because we cannot even begin to understand the depth of their grief and their pain as they wait for word. We thank you that you are with them, that you are their comforter, and that you will give them what they need, the strength and the courage to carry on from here. We thank you for all that you are and all that you do. We thank you that Louise had a great report at the doctor's office and that she doesn't have to go back. Had a wonderful thing. We just love you and we ask that you give a special blessing to our nation this day as we celebrate the holiday of the birth of our nation. We know we are far from perfect as a nation, Lord. We have our faults and our flaws, and they are many, and some are really horrendous, the mistakes that we have made in the past. But help us to learn from those mistakes, Lord, and, and that in the, as in the days of Isaiah where there was a remnant in the country of people who were followers of Christ, who were followers of, of the one true God and who believed and were in awe of you, who were willing to be sent out as messengers. As Isaiah told God, send me. Lord, we thank you for all those who are willing, willing to do what needs to be done, willing to be the one to begin something new. Guide us and walk with us as we live our lives to show others who you are, to show them your love for them and for all people. 
through what we do and say. Lead us in your ways so with we, that we, like Abraham, can be considered righteous in your eyes. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our weekly Bible study continues in the backyard at the Parsonage at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings. Monday mornings. Duh. And, and each week we have a little different scriptures that we're looking at. No rhyme or reason to them, just picking them out at random. So there's no big deal if you can't come one week and you can come the next. So I hope I'll see you there in the backyard at the Parsonage at 10 o'clock on Monday mornings. Vacation Bible School is coming up on July the 17th. It will be from 9 until 2.30. We're still in need of tents. We're thinking about maybe having it outside according to the weather, if it's not too hot or if it's not raining. But we have room at Olivet to have it indoors if we need to. But we'd like to have the tents in reserve just in case. Forestville is doing the food for that. Uh, and uh, if they if you need to get in touch with someone about that and, and bringing something, uh, get in touch with Jean Williams from Forestville. Uh, there are registration sheets. If you need one, let me know and I will get one to you. Uh, and we're taking children uh, that are uh, between the ages of birth and, and 12, 13, 14, when they get to that age where they say, no, I don't need to go. Uh, but even older children than that, we can use as helpers in the different uh, craft areas or, or in the storytelling areas. So if they can't come or don't want to come as a, as a child for vacation Bible school, then, then they can come and be a, a helper. So... I hope that we see you or your child or your grandchild or extended family of, of some kind there. And we will uh, be there again on the 17th. <sighs> Receive this blessing. Go now with the assurance that God loves you, even with your flaws, and that if you believe that miracles do still occur and that you can be a part of those miracles. Show your love for those around you and you will see miracles happen. God's blessings on you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.